Sam, let's begin with your name, uh, where you were born, and what date you were born. Well, Frank, my name is Gerald Sam Yider. I've always had to use the Gerald because that's official, but I'm only known by Sam. And I was born beautifully back in January 2nd of 1918. And right in my own hometown of Lowell. Outstanding. Not in a hospital. <laughs> and that's where I grew up through high school days. Well, let's talk about your early education. Where All did right. you go to school? Where did I go to yeah, school? Yeah, elementary school that, that period of time. All of that schooling is right in the little village of Lowell and through all the grades. So this was a, uh, a building of four stories high with lots of uh, school desks and computers and all that kind of stuff, right? In those days, <laughs> it started in a little small school area before we got into the, the one time that is from the ninth to the twelfth mm -hmm. grades. And it was not much more than a two-story, two-and-a-half-story building. All of that, of course, has been re replaced. Yeah. But in those days, it was a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. So what was uh, high school like? This was in a two-story building, you say? You'd walk to school? or how? how did... Well, yes, because uh, in those days, there were very few cars, you know. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, there, mostly if it were the, the rural folks that had to have transportation. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, I only had to walk about three blocks to get to school. Oh, okay. And uh, so that was, that was a big help. Mm -hmm. How about your mom and dad? What, your, what is your dad's occupation? What's your mom do? Well, my dad was a very successful businessman because he, in the beginning, became a funeral director. And along with, with that, he added on a furniture store, added on a car dealership, and he was very active in the Masons. He was very active. <clears throat> he was a mayor of Lowell on the school board president. And so that he, he did have a very prominent place in the beginning in Lowell. Mm -hmm. My mother was just amazing because she actually pretty much raised all three of us, our kiddies. My sister, six years older than myself. My brother, six years younger than myself. So six, six, six was quite <laughs> interesting. And whatever did happen financially and whatnot with my dad, my mom was able to take in teachers and able to keep things going. And it was just the most wonderful experience as I look back, think back to how important she was in the developing of us three kids. Yeah. Um. Because of your financial situation, then did you have an opportunity to go to higher education, to go to college? Very definitely. I was ready to go to Michigan State, but I did not have any finances, of course. So fortunately, I was able to be with the U.S. Geological Survey for the first year after high school ending up not only in Michigan, New York, Virginia, but in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, actually mapping the White Mountains. So when I come out of there, then I was ready. And in 1936, I started at Michigan State. Hmm. Now, you said that you didn't have the financial wherewithal. Um, did something happen to your father's 
businesses? He wasn't able to pay for your college? Right. In other words, he, he had to, he lost his business. Is that because of the depression? The, the Part crash of, it was of the wall? Much so. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Wow. So that was a difficult time for your family then, I imagine. Oh, yes. Yeah. But with this wonderful guidance and help from a mom, mm -hmm. we all just made it through. Wow. And, uh, so I actually had to work my way through college, wow. which is great. Yeah. And that, uh, <laughs> I would borrow 20 bucks from about four different business people in Lowell to get started. I paid it all back, Yeah. but that's the way I did it. Wow. And I washed dishes uh. at a fraternity house of 40 guys for three years. Peeled the potatoes, washed the dishes. Oh boy, that was that was great. Got you ready for military life, I think. Oh yes. But <laughs> well, what helped it all through that? Michigan State. I played football at Michigan State my freshman year at 132 pounds. Wow. But I had to give it up because I was trying to be a surveyor, an engineer, mm -hmm. but I flunked everything that that college <laughs> set up for me. So I ended up with hotel administration, just the hmm. beginning of it. Hmm. And in all of this, without playing football, I was able to at least stay in the game as a cheerleader. At that time, only men. I ended up in 1940 as the head cheerleader with this squad of 15 guys with these wow. tall megaphones and we wow. got the people to respond and to yell. No pom-poms, no acrobatics. <laughs> we just made them yell. <laughs> so that is, oh yes, one thing more. Through mm -hmm. those years, through the ROTC, it enabled me on graduation to be commissioned a second lieutenant in the cavalry. This is interesting to note that at this time we still had a cavalry. That's horses and oh, swords and the horses. whole bit, right? Yes, indeed. <laughs> That's another story but when it comes well, to horses. Let's talk about a little bit about that. Um, what was your, you joined ROTC, it was available to you, so you just thought, well, this would be fun to do? I mean, why did you even join? Well, that, that was my, my choice. Right in the beginning, so all four years it was pretty, ROTC program along with everything else. Mm. So what was the ROTC like at that time? Well, it was being cavalry. Mm -hmm. It was terrific. I mean, it wasn't just to sit down at your desk and kick your heels around. We were taking care of the horses, riding the horses. Every two weeks, we had to be summer camp at Fort Custer, mm -hmm. Michigan. And that, I'll tell you, if you have to stop and think, I've been through a full charge, full cavalry charge of over 50 horses with the fastest horse leading the charge. And that whole open field is full of chuck holes. And all you could think of at that speed, when your, your back just goes like this, and you just don't say a thing to that horse, but let that horse take over. And by golly, I'll never forget watching that spread 50 horses wide, full speed. Ah. <laughs> but only two other quick stories. Yeah. We had to learn how to handle these horses. So the first time it was in demonstration hall in the winter time, where you could ride around and around like that. So we'd come in and we couldn't pick our horse. We had to take the horse that we walked up to. Did that, started around casually, began to get into a canter, pick it up a little bit, and all of a sudden, the saddle slipped to the underside of that horse, and that horse was getting panicky, and Frank, I had to jump off. <laughs> the sergeant hadn't tightened the cinch. Mm. Oh, okay, that's first. Okay. And the second time, this was quite an experience because it was jumping. And with the best of courage, I started that horse right for the jump. 
beautiful jump all the way across. The minute he got to the other side, he went just like that. And I went straight ahead. To this day, how could anybody <laughs> avoid that? So with four years of that, with only two times off, I think I was pretty happy. <laughs> Now, there was a major uh, event that happened in the lives of Americans. Uh, that was the announcement of Pearl Harbor, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Where were you and what was your reaction to that? As we had just returned, and I say the end of First Armor Division, from maneuvers in Louisiana swamp country and in North Carolina, we finally got back on December 6th of 41 with the announcement of Pearl Harbor. Devastating because we came back to the brick barracks where we were stationed in before and we were out of those brick barracks in the tents immediately and alerted to be prepared to move into very possible combat. Did you have any indication of where you would be going? None whatsoever, other than, other than the fact that we were to go to Fort Dix, New Jersey. And even when we got aboard the Queen Mary, the original Queen Mary, for the first <laughs> troop ship voyage that that Queen took in the North Sea, and even before we got to Ireland, we didn't know it till we got there. Let's backtrack a bit. Um, from the ROTC, uh, you then got into the military itself, I mean, into the, the, the formal military itself. And let's talk about that transition. When did that happen? When I was ordered to, to Fort Knox, Kentucky, on March of 41, Fort Knox, because that was, as it turned out to be, the former cavalry organization. So with all of the Germans, with their tank activities at that time in Europe, it was very essential that the United States had to begin to prepare for that. So in 1940, July of 1940, was the activation of the 1st Armored Division at Fort Knox. And in March of 41, I was there. And it was then to get broken into what the, the closest that we could even think of is that, now wait a minute. This isn't going to be a garrison type of, a, of an experience. We've got to get ready for, a, I guess, for war. But now, you know, you, you must realize that here in this very short period of time, from 1940 until November of 42, that's two years and a couple months from the beginning to in contact in the war against the Germans, the first Americans to fight the Germans. And so, <laughs> it was the most rapid, rapid buildup. And this is my opportunity to try to explain to you, Frank, and to whoever might be interested, that how in the world could a new branch of the army, armor, be formed and committed in that early period of time? So it's not only the vehicles and the armament, but it's the manpower, it's the clothing, it's everything involved here. And the other thing that people have to realize is when I'm talking the armored division, it's so different than the infantry, it's so different than the other branches that have been long, long, a part, a part of, of our history because an armored division has to be fully mobilized right down to the kitchen trucks, the medics, the engineers, the artillery, everyone mobilized on the move. 
So that was an entirely new experience. No field manuals had ever been written. We had to, to just come off the top of our heads. Wow. And so, well, where was we? <laughs> <laughs> I get carried away That's here, you okay. know. How old were you at that when you when you were when you arrived there from the cavalry to be part of this first armored division? <clears throat> I was 21 years old. And as you ask that, I guess it's the time to tell you that at Fort Knox, before we left to go to New Jersey, Fort Dix, the first sergeant called me into the company headquarters. Congratulations, sir. You are now our company commander. Second lieutenant with eight second lieutenants then under me. And that's exactly the way we went from Fort Knox to Fort Knox to Queen Mary to Ireland from Ireland then on up. But it was fortunately at least in, in Ireland. It was a month later when we got there, I got the other bar for first lieutenant. <laughs> then I got the double bar for captain. So I could go into combat as the company commander, as a captain. Let me ask you this. I realize, as you mentioned, you're in your 20s. You now have this responsibility. There's a great deal of pride in achieving that. But there's also a lot of responsibility in terms of you're going into combat. You're going to be responsible for men's lives. Was that any consideration at all at that time? It was understandable. But fortunately, I guess this is the point where I can bring it out that at least I'm an Eagle Scout. The first Eagle Scout in the entire Lowell area, way back in 1931 when I was 13 years old. But from that experience, I've thought back to that many, many times. And at the same time, the real wonderful training we got the ROTC, good old Captain Taylor. Regular Army Captain, Cavalry. And he really taught us like we needed to know. And so, Frank, I, I had to look at it this way. I realized exactly what was expected of us in, in, in whatever there was in writing. And I was determined that I would do exactly that. I wouldn't ask anybody to do what I wouldn't do myself. And whether I had to take my stand with good old regular army GIs right up to sergeants. If they could not get ready with us to meet combat, I had to bring them down, and I did. Sir, I'm gonna do something I've never done before. I would like to shake your hand. Um, I usually do shake hands with the people that I, I interview, but. I want to shake hands Eagle Scout to Eagle Scout. Well, okay. <laughs> you did. Yes, sir. I 21 day hair patches. <laughs> <laughs> then you know what I mean. I do. And I'm, I'm very touched by that because I, I have a great deal of, uh, of pride in the fact that I can say that I'm Eagle Scout. It was my father that pinned the medal on me, by the way. Great. Let's go to the Queen Mary. The Queen Mary still exists today, and Number two. people know all about the Queen Mary, but let's talk about your experience there. I mean, uh, you weren't uh, going there on a luxury tour of the Caribbean or wherever it is that they go on the Queen Mary. Tell us about that. First of all, to the best of my knowledge, there was approximately 10,000 aboard that ship, and it was all built up, I guess it was eight feet high of uh, wooden booths, you know. And uh, that fortunately the Queen Mary had the, the dining facilities so that all the 24 hours there were the shifts to feed, you know. And uh, they took the North Sea route to the British Isles and to Ireland. And that was dodging the icebergs and two distinct times they outran German submarines by the zigzagging 
course that it took and the speed that it had that exactly got us through but there were times that huge big ship that the hallways were just like like that you could hardly really walk it and then it come back and then it would go the other way you know but that was the North Sea and <laughs> The one thing I survived because whoever couldn't hand, handle their their stomach, I would borrow their meal ticket. So I just kept eating and kept eating and kept eating, <laughs> and I passed the word. Whoever else wanted to do it, they could. Wow. <laughs> so the chow was pretty good, huh? Yes, that was. Uh, that that's American, you know. That's Queen Mary. Now. Where did you arrive? What was the destination of the Queen Mary? Where did you go? Right to Ireland, okay. North Ireland. And what was the purpose of being there? Because of a, a necessity to begin our training, combat training now. Okay. Not the maneuvers back in the States. So in the six months that we were there, it was very, the only chance we had to, to finally figure out how to use these weapons and how to, uh, with our reconnaissance, different than the yeah, others. Yeah, let, let's get into that. Let's, let's actually describe, so we have a visual image of the training. What are we looking at? We're talking about one tank, we're talking about five tanks, we're talking about jeeps, you're talking about, what, what are we actually seeing when you're doing these maneuvers? Okay, because again of the first armored division and being the armored, that there were the tank battalions, there were the medium tank battalions and the light tank battalions. And the half tracks were the vehicles that were used that were more flexible, mobile and so forth than the tanks but not as secure, it only had a half inch of armor plate. But the other thing is the Jeep. And going way back to 1941, when I arrived at Fort Knox, I was one of the first to receive the American Jeep. And so, between the Jeeps and the half tracks, that was what our reconnaissance that's we had. And I was prepared mentally, thinking ahead now, reconnaissance. I'm not going to be picking the fights against the enemy to find out who they are, because I'm going to lose my men by so doing it. If I can carry out the orders from the higher headquarters, I'll do it by the sneak and the peek. I'll find the way to get it done without losing a man. And I never did. I lost three men in the whole time we were in combat. And we never, never agitated or disturbed the enemy in any way by firing the first shot on him. And I, I, I kept telling myself, now look, if they do see us, they aren't going to bother us because they know that what's behind us. And so if we <laughs> tip them off, the big boys behind will come right down on them. And you know, that paid off. Yeah. We'll get into that a little later. Let's, let's uh, go back to the training. Um, let's talk in terms of the Jeep. You, you mentioned earlier one of the first Jeeps in, in, the, in the U.S. Army. What is, what is your rating in the Jeep? What did you think of the Jeep? Absolutely the thing that saved our lives. <laughs> oh, good guys, yes. Because we would place that windshield down and completely cover it right on up. We would sandbag the floor. We would uh, do everything that was necessary to keep the low profile and to be as uh, capable of getting through artillery fire and whatnot because we still had to do our job, you know. Well, let's, let's get into that part right there in terms of your job. The uh, tank, the role of the tank in combat is often thought of as the 
cannons being shot off and things blowing up off in the distance and big engagements and whatnot. But what was the role of your particular group? You were reconnaissance. So what does that mean? The reconnaissance is the foremost portion of any combat-oriented type of a maneuver. We were the eyes and the ears for the command. Frank, the command could not move until we had already cleared that particular uh, track ahead. And once we had cleared it all, then we were positioned to as close to the enemy as it was possible. And there again, it was keeping the higher command on a one-to-one -one knowledge of just exactly what was happening. There again, as I say, that's, it, it, it's not to, to draw the fire of the others to f find out what, what's there, but it was to, as I just said, sneak and peek and get the information back. Then again, we imagine this, every, we were in two withdrawals. And who was the rear guard on each of those? My reconnaissance. We were the very last and stayed right in contact with the oncoming drive of the Germans. Uh, excuse me, Sam, this sounds dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Only as you have a chance to think back ah, okay. at that time. Yeah. It was, it had to be done. Somebody had to do it, and we were always so grateful that they depended on us, yeah. and they did. I think that's where it really comes down to. I guess I was, I wasn't making light of it. I was trying to make a point that, as that, at that age and within your generation, that, that those people that went out and laid their lives on the line for people like me and the people out in the audience, uh, you didn't really think about those things until later. You, say, you know, that was pretty dangerous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, let's go now from, uh, you've arrived now uh, from the Queen Mary. You're in Ireland. You went through six months of, of training. Where did you go from there? From there we went into British Isles, into England. And from there to Scotland. Because at Scotland is where we're to board the Maracaibos. The Maracaibos that take us, we couldn't tell our men where, but I knew because being the head of the reconnaissance, I was taken to London and, and briefed on it. So I knew that we were heading for North Africa and RN. This is, this is very interesting because I've interviewed several veterans uh, from this area that were either infantry or you know in under you so to speak not ne necessarily you particularly but and they were always said you know, we didn't know where we were going so you actually were informed tell me about London what what happened Did they were you were sent to London to be briefed on where you're going next oh yes where yes. did you go where, where in London I mean where in right London? in right in the center of the of the city of London everything sandbagged. Oh, um, yeah, tell us about London at that time, because this is, this is the Battle of Britain we're talking about. Yeah. This is the period of time when, what was your experience in arriving in London? Let's hear about that. Well, we could see and live the, at first hand that terrible devastation caused by the Germans and their, their uh, round-the-clock bombing, and, and that there was hardly anything that had not been touched, mm -hmm. you know, almost literally destroyed. And that, uh, as I said, they even had the sandbags literally what, protecting what, what still stood, you know. And uh, now I wasn't alone. I was along with the other regimental. Now how many guys people. are you talking about? Three, four, five, ten? Six of us. Six of you, okay. Went into that, yeah. Now, you go into a, an office and you're about to be briefed, who was briefing you? Was it British or the Americans, or who were briefing you? Well, the British were there, and of course. You're I all in uniform, I take it. Oh, okay. definitely, oh, yeah. It's all salutes and then oh, very certainly. formal. 
Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're sitting down in a room. Was there yeah. a map up there? I mean, give oh, us yeah. a, visually try and give me an idea of what you're seeing when you walk into this place. Well, you just explained it. Yes, oh. it was a uh, table set down, and there was the, the, the large map on the wall. But I can tell you right now, there was not any maps as we got to North Africa other than the Arab maps or the French maps. Mm. And we had to go by almost like the crow flies. <laughs> wow. But it was at that particular time, all they could reveal to us was that we would be landing in Oran, Algeria. And that in the full knowledge that the British were driving Rommel and the Desert Fox, beautifully, fully trained, experienced desert fighters, yeah. and they were coming right straight towards our Algeria and Tunisia. But that's as far as they could go. And that the next was the arrangements to get all of our vehicles fully armed, fully gassed, fully ready to come off of those Maracaibos where the front just opens up or drops down, you know. And we always had to laugh because if a submarine had hit us on en route to to Oran. Mm -hmm. It would just be one blah, 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 right down like that because with all of those vehicles, the ammunition and the gas and everything else, <laughs> it didn't happen. So we, we did get there. Yeah. Um, what was the, uh, the, the people who actually briefed you in, in London? Uh, were these generals, colonels? I mean, what, what are we looking at here? To be very honest, I could not really answer that frankly okay, that's right. be because actually now I was probably the, the, the most junior of anybody there okay. so I was just absolutely staying very quiet and listening and watching right. uh, but there definitely there were high uh, in, in the general ranks that were there they had to be you know because this was pretty doggone important you know it's interesting to note that uh, you're in a starch uniform, you're standing with a bunch of other people in, in, in uniform, and you're planning with this map on the wall, but in actual fact, the men that would have to carry this out are going to be in the hot desert under very dangerous conditions. Was that any, did, did, did that enter your mind at all, or were you just focused on this is what we need to do, and I'm going to go back and tell the men this is what we're going to do, and we're going to go out and do it? I can answer that very quickly. I couldn't go back and tell the men. That's the first thing. Secondly, I had to do something because of what you just said with the desert. We're going to get into these sandstorms and whatnot. So what I did is took a half of my one of my kitchen trucks and loaded it up with chewing tobacco <laughs> and hard candy. <laughs> and I think I saved many lives in those desert storms later on because it's just about everybody was chewing up on that and spitting out that tobacco. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was what I had thinking ahead. And uh, of course, I did not realize that not only was there sand storms to face, but northern. Africa does have the rolling hills and uh, even a mountain chain. Chain. Let's let's go into the actual logistics here. What what equipment were you responsible for? I mean, like one tank, five tanks, two jeeps, three. What what was actually within your domain? <clears throat> well, now in in the structure there are three platoons, and there's the headquarters platoon. Each of these now had the, the jeeps and the half tracks. And it was only later in the game that I soft talked 
higher echelon to give me some light tanks. And I finally did get them. Never shot them, but I had them. And that, that was kind of a, uh, a backup for the men. With, there was a little bit of something they, they could respond if they had to, you know. But I can't give you the exact numbers. Sorry. But that's, now I have to add to that, the kitchen trucks. You know, my gosh, those kitchen trucks saved our lives too, you know, whenever they could get anywhere near us. Because otherwise, we only had the sea ration, the can that we had to live on. Mm -hmm. And thanks be, it was armor because there was the manifolds that would heat up the soup or whatever, you know, <laughs> and uh, without lighting a fire. <laughs> Don't need microwave ovens in so, that kind uh, of an environment, huh? But I think this is the time I'd like to make mention of this, Frank. You've got to realize that we have done all that I've talked about with only the training vehicles, training armament, training clothing. Everything moves so fast that, goodness gracious, there we were heading into combat against real, real prepared enemy, the Germans. Well, Rommel's, <laughs> Rommel is legend. I mean, oh, this yes. is a genius in, in terms of uh, the warfare in North Africa, and your training was not even close to that. Of course not. Did you know yourself at that time, did you know who Rommel was or what his record was, or was there any kind of briefing saying, look out, this guy is pretty sharp? Only in the London briefing and then only after we reached Oran. And then I could really explain why we were there, what Rommel really was, and what probably we could expect, you know. Would you say that <clears throat> it was accurate, the description of him was accurate in terms of your uh, uh, strategies, in terms of how you're going to fight against him? Because as you probably know, in the Pacific War, uh, soldiers were told the Japanese couldn't fight. They had Coke bottle eyes and, you know, their glasses and they had buck teeth. And was any of that given to you in terms of the Germans, or were they nope. saying, no, be careful, these guys know what they're doing? They were very accurate and very, uh, very right about what they, what they explained to us. Okay. I didn't hold anything back from the men either. They needed to know that too. So let's go now from training uh, into actual battle. What was your first engagement, and what was that like? Well, outside of the landing at our, at our end, see these Maracaibos come in, but they couldn't get in any closer than six feet of water. So as they dropped down the front end, I was the first one off with my Jeep. And we had to have them all waterproof, and right down. <laughs> what an experience that was. But then we had to get back up and D, take the waterproofing all off the vehicles and then head to the nearest airport without a map and without a flag. See, we were combat. They had, the rear rest line had, had, had time to get us a, a flag. And so we did get to that airport and without any any problem and that in fact I'll have to tell you this years or er, year or two later when I got back into that area I never could find that road <laughs> so how did how did we get there you know <laughs> but I have to go back one other time you said when was the first time it was really while we we're still in the Oran area and my first mission was to clear the perimeter, including the French Foreign Legion. I had to go direct into their full garrison 
not knowing whether they are going to accept us or whether they're going to tear us apart. That time I had my American flag flying. Mm -hmm. And Frank, we actually got there, got through there, beyond there, thanks be nobody was there. This story would never have happened if it worked in another way, you know. Yeah. yeah. So that was the first real confrontation. Right. That was French. Yeah. And that, uh, now the others, remember, there was two days and nights fighting the French, and there was terrible losses on a couple of our transport ships coming in because the, the French were really fighting. Mm. So it was only then after that two days and nights, they decided to join. So we had the, the French on our side. Yeah. All we had to then look forward to was the Italians and the Germans. So what was your mission specifically at that moment, at, at that particular time you're talking about now? What was your mission? What were you supposed to be doing? Getting, we already did the French Foreign Legion thing. Right. But back, to, we got to the airport and we had to make sure to hold that as best as we could. We didn't have to fight to do it. And that, to me, that following us, and you see, came the tanks. And they're the ones that went on through and cleared that airport and went right on approaching Oran itself, the city. So that, that put us again in the rear position. After we got them there, then we, yeah. they went through, and then we stayed on behind to clear that. Now, I grew up in a generation of TV shows, and one of them was uh, Rat Patrol, which was the Jeeps in the North Africa with the machine guns and the guys bouncing around. Did you have one of those? Was that, was that completely Hollywood, or is that something that you guys had as part of your group? No, we didn't have it. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And there are two different times I let the, let the, the, let the guys follow their, th their suggestion that we ought to have a machine gun on that doggone Jeep. And uh, all right, I let it. I let two of the jeeps try it. I had to talk the maintenance people, and finally got up to within somewhat within range of us to mount those doggone machine guns. But why would I let it be on every jeep when we weren't to be fighting with those jeeps? You see, yeah. but I, I. Did as I just said, to, to satisfy them, at least I was willing to give it a try, you know. Mm -hmm. So these jeeps were, in terms of the whole theater of the North African campaign, these, the, the depiction of the Rat Patrol, these guys going out and fighting with these things is not really that accurate, then I take it. Not in our theater. <laughs> okay. No, sir. <laughs> Too dangerous. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> because the jeeps were used back and forth for headquarters and so forth. And look, look at Frank. There was nothing to stop uh, any kind of armament coming in. Nothing like the tanks had, or even the half tracks had, uh, uh, much more than the, the jeeps. You know, I think I think it's important that we point out now. Desert warfare compared to jungle warfare, compared to you know the the invasion of a beach, or the compared to uh, going through the the hedgerows of in in France. What is desert? warfare like? If there wasn't the desert storms, the sand storms, it wouldn't be any other than just making sure that you were not going to get hung up and get into a, a situation where you're hung up underneath and you had to be pulled out to get out of there. And that Our experience 
our division in the desert was mainly what I just started with the sandstorms and they were vicious. In other words, uh, uh, we didn't have the equipment even to to fight it. We had to do with what we had. We didn't very few goggles to begin with, you know. And uh, but we just had to keep going, even in the in the blasting of the sandstorms, and that uh, the temperature would get up to 120 degrees. And that meant that every machine gun, every bit of armament was at boiling hot, you know. And I'll be very honest now. Fortunately, we did not in, engage in that desert combat. What we did do, though, here's another thing that we the reconnaissance found out, that we had to form like a cylinder wall so that as the British were pushing Rommel in toward uh, through Libya right coming into Tunisia and, and uh, Algeria that we had to be able to stop their oncoming and this is in the, started in the desert and so help me how many times I've thought back to this. They moved us, the reconnaissance now, because we had our jeeps and our half tracks and we could move fast. We would go all night long on top of the previous day under almost total blackout. Not even a matchstick of light, everything masked off. And yet we would move between 50 miles overnight. What the Germans saw us down here, they saw us up here, but they, in fact, this fella that we talked about here before, the German officer oh, that good, was at yeah. Kasserine Pass, yeah, yeah. he himself said, we never understood. We thought you had far more opposing us than what it turned out to be. And so, <laughs> to me, that has been a very, very delicate and an interesting experience that happened. Sure. So, after then, Rama got through the desert, back into the rolling hills to the very north. That's then again, you see, where we were into these full confrontations. Before we get into the confrontations themselves, <clears throat> what vehicle were you in? And were you in the lead? You're, you're up in the front? I mean, give us an idea of the formation. I can picture, and I think most people can, this desolate environment. This is desert, it's hot, it's sand everywhere, you're caked in this. It's not like you can go down to the uh, local bathroom and take a shower and come back into the tank, which is air conditioned. Of course, <laughs> yours wasn't air conditioned. No. <laughs> um, give us an idea. You say you know, you're traveling 50 miles or whatever. What, what are we looking at in terms of a formation? Give us an idea of who's in the front, who's on the sides. What does this look like? I was the front. Many times the Jeep, but then the command track, half track. And in the command half track, that's where I had my contact with my platoon leaders, with their, and you know, the radios were so terrible. Yeah. It was horrible. And we had to go by dot and dat, not voice, yeah. until the Kasserine Pass. First time that we could go right direct out. So it was Morse code, you're communi right. communicating by Morse code. That, okay. That, yep. Yeah. And that, so let's say, for example, I mean, give us an example here. We, part of the reason why we do these oral histories is to get a better visual idea of what your actual experience was. Things that you've gone through are images in your mind, but somebody outside of this may not have any idea. Let's say, for example, you're in the very front, you're in the half track. Who's behind you? 
where we were actually on a particular uh, routing that it would be in order the first platoon, second platoon, third platoon. But otherwise, I, I had already committed the three platoons. And I was then the, the home base to continue this communication contact and to be where I could at any moment by my Jeep, command Jeep, back to the headquarters, back and forth and back and forth, leaving my operators at the command track, you know, okay. to take care of what still was uh, needed, you see. Sam, did you have any idea what was right in front of you? Or your job is to find out what's in front of you, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Quick answer to that, there was hardly at any time that we weren't in close contact with the German forces. Mm. And that, uh, uh, I'm trying to think back, and I couldn't say when we weren't or when we were not, but most of the time we were, you yeah. see. Did you ever come into a situation where you come up over a knoll and there they are? No. No. Okay. Because uh, there are other times now, as you ask that, yep. there are times that I would have the number two, one, two, three, the center tune. Mm -hmm actually out ahead and the, the other two on the, on the sides mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so that could probably happen to them okay but it would not have happened to me okay let's talk about the Kazarine Pass what was what led up to it and how much did you know about the upcoming battle and what was your participation in it okay Well, let me let me get sure. to approach it this way. Sure. Uh, we landed on November eighth, forty-two, there at Oran, and on December eighth and ninth, we were faced with our first American withdrawal, and this was where. Here I was with my company spread out like this. And sure enough, the German had unlaunched their first tank attack on us. And I was, in my company, able to give that first information back to the headquarters and stay there long enough to make sure that it was definitely a, a full-fledged attack and then begin our withdrawal. I <laughs> cut loose my kitchen truck first and got that out of the way. And then back we started to move under tank artillery fire. They got two of my half-tracks, but I made other half-tracks Told those two right back out of there and get us all back because we had no replacements. If we didn't do that, we wouldn't be able to keep our others going. And what absolutely to this day, I'll never forget it. Here there was a whole battalion of light tanks that were in beautiful overlooking positions. They pulled out ahead of me. They got out of there. <laughs> but I still got everybody back. So, okay, no. But that, that was way back in, in December. Mm -hmm. And so. Let me just, you brought up another point I think is interesting. Being under attack in the vehicle that you're in and through all your men there, give us an idea that I'm, I'm picturing confusion and and bombs going off and shells exploding and sand and it's hot. And How do you keep your head in something like that? How do you keep 
knowing that you've got the responsibility of all these vehicles and all these people in there, and you've got to get them out of there, I, I can't fathom it, Sam. How, how do you pull this off? <laughs> There's only one sensible, logical way to do that, Frank. In other words, the best thing to do is to set the course to get out of there, and you've got to make sure that you're any time these rounds are coming in, left or right or over, ahead and whatnot, if you stop, you're just sitting duck. But keep on the move. The faster you can clear it, the safer it's going to be. Because you aren't going to be able to turn around and, and stop the, the shelling and stop the firing, you know? And so uh, it is the knowledge that the sooner we get back where the big guys, our big guys, can take over, mm -hmm. and which then it turned out to be, you see. Now, you had mentioned earlier that the radios were really defective, they're not very good. You're in full retreat now. You've got two half tracks that have been knocked out, and you're dragging them, basically, right? You've got yeah. other. Yeah. How are you telling people how to do this? I mean, they're not just doing it on their own, right? You're, you're orchestrating this whole thing. In other words, even at that very early date, because gasoline passes when they, we went into the clear. Yeah. But that was an emergency. That was, in other words, <laughs> what information was going out was just telling the enemy that we're retreating, you know. And that was just a decision I had to make. Yeah. And he, he never. Uh, faulted me for it. Well, you got them all out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, but how did you communicate, though? I mean, how did you? I mean, I'm just picturing this this movement forward of, of this of all this metal and all these men, and there's the enemy over there shelling you and everything. I mean, how are you talking to the the various people to get them to make sure to, to move to to move out of there? Well, again, now. Each of the platoons had the communication right with the headquarters, me. And that before we dispatched to, to whatever, they all knew the positions they're going to, to be in. Okay. And that let the Morse code transactions go back and forth. Because again, we were not picking the fights. Right. See? Right. That, that's the difference between the others behind, the infantry, the, <laughs> the tanks, and right. whatever, you know. And uh, so it, uh, there, there had to be that form of communication. You aren't going to use hand signals to do it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, now move to the Kazarine Pass then. Um, what was that engagement? Your participation in that engagement. Okay. Just prior to that, we had been up in the Alsatia Valley fighting for the French. The French had been attacked up there, and they diverted us, and I had my three platoons, mm -hmm. left, right, center, right smack up that valley, just like that. and. There was a battle. Same thing happened there again. We got as far as we could go and, and right in contact, you know. And that's when the, the, the tanks could then move in with the artillery take over, and then we were able just to yeah. slip on back. And when that was all over, we were ordered back down to the approaches to the Kasserine Valley. And I'll never forget this, Frank. We had to come back down, blackout, back down a zigzagging route where it was no, no guide rails or anything else. And if you went off of that particular track, it was down Oh my gosh, it seems like miles. Yeah. Yep. And we got every vehicle down that night. 
every single one. This day I just wonder why. <laughs> and, but there is when we were then to be positioned enough ahead of the Catherine Pass itself because at least our headquarters was aware that Rommel apparently was planning this, his final attack. And if he made, made it through Kasserine, the pass, it would open up the entire Tunisia and the entering him right into Algeria and that would give him the still the control of the Mediterranean area. It would change the course of the oh, war, too. Oh, it certainly would. Yeah. So, what then happened, sure enough, the very first reports was right from us, back to the headquarters, and as they started that attack, we just had to fall back ahead of it. And I lost one full track, but I, the men were hit. I got all those men on my command track to get them out of there. Yeah. And so <laughs> I, oh, well, let me see. What happened, the Kasserine Pass, out ahead yet, mm -hmm. old Pop Gardner with his medium tank battalion was in a uh, turret defilade in the dry wadi, you know. What, what so, do you, I don't understand that. Well, turret defilade, yeah. the whole tank is down in the wadi and, and only the, the guns oh, are, are showing. showing. Okay, all right. And uh, as this attack, full-fledged attack, armor attack approached, Bomb, this is shells going off. This is well, not, dirt being blown up. They, and they, they weren't firing yet. They were just okay. on the move. Okay. And old Pop Gardner got the word out, be ready, but don't fire until I give the order. He gave the order, and eight German tanks went up in flavors, flight and flames, just like that. And it so stunned that German attack that they... they held up right there. Now that, by that time it was late in the afternoon and so it was very necessary then that we had to withdraw from that and to get in through that pass into the a valley and beyond. And so all night long with all the retreating we were the last. We were covering that withdrawal. And that's why I was the last to get into that Kasserine Valley before the engineers put the, put the mines. And sure enough, they, they got through the pass. They got through into the valley. Hmm. And briefly now, I don't recall the, the, the times here, mm -hmm. but while they were still fighting to come up in that valley. What our artillery man was able to do was to get coordinated. There were some British, uh, a little bit of French artillery available, plus our own. He coordinated it all so he could form a, a, a carpet barrage, a rolling barrage. So every 10 yards, zoom, zoom, nothing alive could withstand that, you see. And it did. It drove the, the Germans right back, right through back to, through that pass. And for the first time, we found an American plane coming in to bomb. First time. All of this time before, I haven't talked about that, the Germans had air super, superiority, and they used it. We had to watch left, right, backward, every movement that we made. They'd come in and strafe the old roads that we were on. They'd come in just like that, just right almost <laughs> clipping the hedges. Mm. 
and all you had to do was like that to get to the nearest cover. And <laughs> well, that was the air superiority that they did enjoy. But then, what happened to finish this? The first back out of that Castorine Pass was us. I was able to get four British sappers to probe that main road for the, the mines right. that were placed. Yeah. Because the Germans had booby-trapped their own dead, they booby-trapped everything you could think of. So all my word to my men, don't you leave this main road track for, under any, whatever the reason, you know. Then, okay. So that was when Rommel went back to Germany. And the rest of it was finally, we got him bunched right up to where it was 100,000, I think it was, prisoners. Mm. Were you involved in any of the prisoners? I mean, did you actually have to take care of prisoners yourself, your, your group? No. Okay. Remember, we were reconnaissance. Right, right. But when it comes to the rounding up, oh, well, yes, we are involved there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so after the Kazarine Pass, what was the, the next major engagement, or what, what, what happened after that for, for your group? Well, then, you see, the Germans began to, to bunch up, form back up to the north, northeast corner up there. Uh, and there were the, there were the, uh, uh, the battles, and I'm glad you asked that because here comes another instance. Here we were, reconnaissance, as I've told you. Sure. But on this particular attack, we became infantry, and we had to take up this dug gun hill as a part of the attack strategy. And that's son of a gun, we lost one of my men. Mm -hmm. Didn't lose one. But, yep, they did it out of their vehicles, yeah. right on the ground and right on up, you know. And that uh, uh, it was kind of ticklish, I say, at that time, because we knew that we had them. We knew that, that they were. Uh, uh, certainly ready to give up. We didn't want any more, any more casualties, yeah. but yet we had to keep going, yeah. and that we did. Yeah. And so, Sam, you had mentioned earlier that you, the entire time, you only lost three men, which is commendable. You just mentioned the one in the infantry attack. How did the other two get killed? The other two, one was, I remember his name, Smart, and that was when, yeah, that was in that withdrawal, that back in December uh, 8th and 10th, and we just never heard from him again. And, from him again. We just, I had hoped that he would eventually even turn up as a POW, you no. Know. But no, that never did happen. Was he in a, a, a Jeep or a vehicle and then just no, disappeared? He, he was, or? You know, a, so he went out somewhere and yeah, never came back, yeah. in other words. Well, he, he was caught up in, in, in the withdrawal, right. you see. And I don't know what he, what he had at the time. The other fellow was a, top-notch mechanic, GI, and he just got caught under one of the artillery bar barrages. And the only officer was, he was with his Jeep. In fact, he was the one that reported back the tracks of a Tiger tank, the German Tiger tank, which <laughs> the track is this wide, mm -hmm. and it has the 88 millimeter gun and one foot of armor, and <laughs> uh, but 
he got it there. And you know, every leader has to has to take the responsibility of it. But you know, Sam, considering the amount of danger you you and your group are in, it's really quite commendable that only three were lost. And I guess, although it must hurt you that you lost those three, you got to realize that it could have been the whole group. Well, could absolutely, have been you too, yes, you know? absolutely, Frank. And that's that's uh, I've I've talked to guys who who uh, you know lost seventy percent of their guys. And all of this, with what I've already said earlier, with the equipment that we had, and what we had to to fight with or to survive with, and so forth, and how <laughs> it, it it even compounds the question. Why only those few? Yeah. Well, I have to think back before we get lose it. Sure. <laughs> Somewhere along the line, when the rear echelon got got up to us, I begged it to be deloused <laughs> by a whole company was just oh, you wouldn't want to live with us. We can live with each other, but <laughs> no. But we finally were called back and went through and got our first in two months' time, first pair of socks, first clothes we had to live right on all that time, and a beautiful shower and clean clothes. Oh, what a relief that was. <laughs> For those that don't know what de-loused means, there's louse. <laughs> you had bugs on you is what you're saying. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, after the Kazarine Pass, were there any other major uh, uh, encounters, or was it more of just the, the, the same, going out, reconnaissance, and then coming back and... Well, it was, it, as I just mentioned, where I lost one of my men when we had to go on yeah. that, that one attack there. So th these were these small pockets and whatnot that had to be done, yeah. but it was driving them all back to where they finally surrendered. Right. And, and then it was... Uh, We'd done our part. The rest of it had to be the rear island that, that had to take over from there. Well, let's let's deal with that moment. Were you in the field when the the uh, surrender happened? Were you actually still in in, in uniform? In oh, oh, certainly. Well, let's talk about that. What? Ha how did you find out, and what was the reaction? Well, I can't answer that. I cannot recall exactly when the word came through that that uh, that the war was over, or at least the, German, the, the no, European. That, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I remember uh, one of the generals. Oh, geez, this is where it's difficult for me to pull back. That's all right. Names, Bradley. Ah, Bradley. Yeah. Uh, Bradley. He was just like a GI. And he was the most gracious, most friendly. Just, he wasn't like what you would think and what I've known generals to be, you know. And so I can remember that very vividly because he went on to be a pretty fine yeah. four-star general. And uh, I want to have to, that reminds me too. <laughs> okay. Once I got a replacement in, an officer replacement, way early in the game. Frank Clay was his name. A West Pointer, second lieutenant, and his dad was General Clay back in the States, was a pretty prominent man. But even with that kind of a backup, I put Frank right in line with the other uh, platoon leaders and got him roughed up pretty doggone good. And he, but he survived. But you know what? He came out of it all as a brigadier general. Wow. And there was a regimental, 13th Auburn Regiment, gathering back at Fort Knox, where he was to be uh, honored as the commander. And he put me right up on the reviewing stand, right along with him. And <laughs> he says, you know, he never forgot how I really worked him over good. The best thing that ever happened to him, he said. <laughs> oh, geez. Now, you mentioned Bradley. For the students, 
watching this, it's a name and it's a picture in a history book. What was your actual encounter with, with Bradley? I mean, you've said some very complimentary things about him. I mean, did you actually meet him? Did you get a chance to see him? Oh, that's exactly what I'm speaking of. In other words, as we were walking around, and by this time we had the, the fencing in to hold all of the prisoners inside. But uh, I was able to chat just briefly with him. Mm -hmm. That's why I knew he was so, uh, uh, not like the hard-nosed uh, generals a lot of them could be, you know. And it was, uh, I can remember that as he went on up, became a very high-ranking yeah. general, you know. I have, as you know, uh, interviewed quite a few of the Flying Tigers about Claire Chenault, their leader, and they said that immediately they could tell that this guy was a leader. This, this, this is a guy that they could, they could listen to, that they could trust. Did you feel that way about Bradley when you met him? Uh, being exactly the way that it was, at that time this was over, the fighting was over, you know, and that all that was ahead was our returning back out of Tunisia all the way back to Robot on the other side. And so, no, that, that didn't okay. occur to me then. And you mentioned the, the wiring around for the prisoners then. So you're literally gathering thousands, I would imagine, now, of German prisoners, yeah. okay? They, their, their arms have been, ta their guns have been taken away from them and whatnot. Um, you're herding them into an area, you're putting fencing up. The, the, the troops are putting fencing up and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> so you, you, what was your responsibility at that? Just basically to, to make sure that they don't do anything stupid? At that, at that stage of the game, Frank, that's where the rear echelon people completely took over. Okay. All, we, the combat folks, were getting our, our troops back into our own little areas and that uh, knowing that we had then to go all the way back across mm -hmm. right. to the Cork Forest there in Robot, which turned out to be. Yeah. What was your impression of the German soldiers? I mean, the, the captured ones. I mean, they were young, they were old, they were, what, what did you see? They were a bunch of tired men. And they, they were all of that. They were the young ones. And, uh, uh, I don't remember too many on the real old side because mm -hmm. I think by this time where they'd come as far as they had fighting all the way across with the British that it was the strongest and the youngest that, that could uh, survive all of that and that uh, thanks be we we did not run into any SS guys or any of uh, the uh, group yeah. type of people and that uh, I, I can answer your question. They were relieved. They were mighty happy that for them this was over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did you get, did, did you opt to stay in the military? Did you opt to, to get out at the end of your term? What did you decide to do? Well, now this was still in <laughs> Well, you see, I still had my company, had to get it all back across North Africa to, to Rabat and into the cork forces, or forests. And at that time, then I was replaced and sent on up on staff of the combat command. And that was a rough time to say goodbye to those guys. <laughs> but I had to do it. Let's, uh, I know this might not be easy, but let's, for the record, what was the experience like saying goodbye to these guys? You pulled them all out alive. Alive, Sam. I think each of us had that very strong thought we were so thankful that we had lived through what we had been through and that the 
And my, my lieutenants all made it through, you see. And they were still second lieutenants. They, they finally ended up as first lieutenants. And uh, that uh, I went on into Italy as a, as a captain yet. But I do remember the, the last formation out in this open field. And you know what these guys did? I got it at home. It's a knife, one of these knives encased. And they had it engraved. Captain Sam Yider. <laughs> and uh, so I thought that was kind of touching because <laughs> how the devil they got got the wherewithal to do that, but they did. <laughs> and uh, one of the few things that they got away with that you didn't know about, I imagine. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's, that is sure right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, now you're on the the staff. What was that experience like? Entirely different. I was and the operations assistant. And it was entirely different because, uh, again, now, uh, I could not have any more to do with my company. I know they were there. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, a time or two that if I knew where they were moving out, I'd get out there and give them a highball, you know. <laughs> but that. Uh, they had me pretty much aligned to, to do the night duties, of which an amazing, in other words, I, I would take over at night so the entire staff would get a full night's sleep, which meant that the next day I was half awake, half asleep. Uh, and I appreciated that because that that had to be done, and they de they depended on me to do it. Mm -hmm. So you're a captain yeah. at this time. Um, who was your immediate superior? Well, it was General Robinette in North Africa, but then uh, he was wounded, and. There was two others. Oh, Dewey was the second. Mm. Uh, that's, all, that's all right. I'm just what I'm trying to right. establish is that you had there was a hierarchy here that you reported to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In other and, words, here it is within the division. Now there's mm -hmm. the division headquarters, and there's the division that then overseas the combat command A, the combat command B. Okay. These are the, the fighting forces. Mm -hmm. I'm, I was combat command B. And that the generals were Robinette and the next one and then finally Dewey. Mm -hmm. And that uh, only Rob, Robinette and the next one were brigadiers. Dewey was a full colonel. And that uh, Dewey had the was with us when we broke out of Anzio mm -hmm. and all the way through Rome, all the way on up into the Po Valley. And it was that time that I got two hours sleep a night, or in the, out of the 24, because again, I was holding the, the entire staff mm -hmm. headquarters at night through, you know, through the combat times and the moving. Were you uh, on the radio? Or you? What were you? Oh, what yes. were you doing? Oh, you're on oh, the radio. Yeah. Okay, oh, so yes. you're communicating. That's oh, what yes. you're up. That's what you're up in the. Yep. Okay. So whatever had happened throughout that night, first thing was a report into the, the rest of the staff. You know, and. Uh, um. At the end of the war, then. What what happened? What was your next thing? I mean, after you've been on the staff now, did you go home? All right. Here's the next. Okay. Been there for three years now in combat. And I come back to the armored school. And I became an instructor at the armored school and I wrote the reconnaissance field manual because 
here's what has happened. First Armored Division is the only division that had fought in the desert. We got into Italy and they put us in the very center through the entire mountainous terrain for the entire country. So we lived through that the division. Incidentally, at one time, we had to take out 36 Tiger tanks. And the way we did it, by Cub Plain, photos down below, find little trails off of the main road where the Tigers were positioned, get around behind them and hit them in the rear and knock them out. Hmm. It's the only vulnerable spot that those Tigers had. Well, that, that came into my mind. <laughs> but, <laughs> and every one of us, every tank manual had to be written. Engineer's manual, medic's manual, the signal manual, the infantry. Oh, goodness gracious. We all lived through this, Frank, by the seat of our pants and by what we absolutely had to do, and we did it. And so my reconnaissance manual lasted, I guess, about 17 years. But you wow. see now, at Baghdad, at the drive with the 4th uh, Division, with, they had the reconnaissance element break, st er, starting that whole drive. But they had the Hummers, they had the Adams tanks, they had the helicopters, <laughs> but they had the exact same mission that we had with the Jeeps and the half tracks. So you see, the, the manuals had to change because it was up there, I think I knew of at least 15 armor divisions before everything. 17 uh, years is a pretty good run for a book. <laughs> Do you have a copy of that? Just one. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. You hold on to that. I'd love to see it someday. I would just like to see it. Um, what uh, wound up your military career? Did you end up coming back to to Lowell, or how did you get back here? After my, my army school time there, I decided, okay, I'm not going to try to be a general. I've seen enough of that. <laughs> I think I'll just give it a try back into the business world, which then I did go back to Michigan State. Did you have a sweetheart at that time? When I got back in 1945, at the same time I got back, uh, I had a month's delay en route before I had to report back in. And that's when I married my school the friend, her name was Ida, of which we went 49 three quarters years before she finally had to give up with her cancer. Yeah. But yeah, that was right. But after I got my college extra mm -hmm. term in there, I went to work in a hotel and they, <laughs> They really worked me over. <laughs> Almost broke my back. Mm. So I had to come back home to recover from that. But then all of a sudden they recalled me as a major now. As a major, they recalled me and sent me to Greece to re relieve a lieutenant colonel infantry officer to send him to Korea because armor was more needed in Greece than Korea. So for one year, I was stationed in Salonika, northern Greece. There's only three, three of us army officers up there, 300 in Athens. But I put in 36 field trips with the Greek army. I had to teach the generals army tactics, and I did it in the sand and rocks. That, after that year, I was sent right on up to Salzburg, Austria, into intelligence, G2. And so for the next two years, I was in Austria 
And that's where we adopted our boy and our girl mm -hmm. from, the, from Germany. So then after that, I decided, well, that was my three years. This time I am going to try for the business world. And that's when we did come back with the kitties. Mm -hmm. And then everything else was in selling. Um, usually when I, the, one of the last questions I always ask, given your experience in the time of war, what, what did that do to benefit your, the rest of your life? Was there something that happened during that period of time or was there something you learned during that period of time that gave you the, the, uh, experience, the courage, whatever it is, to, to go through the rest of your life? One thing foremost is that I was so grateful, Frank, for what now we have kind of talked about and all that of the experiences and all the lessons learned there, that it assured me that I should be able to do something in the business arena and to follow through with the, the same basics that I kind of live by. And so that is why I did go to selling. And it was, this will be kind of fast, but I have to touch on it. Sure. I started out first selling cars for my brother-in-law. I could sell them, but I just couldn't be happy with some of my best friends not listening to me but go bite somebody else. <laughs> so Rich DeVos of Amway happened to stop by and keep teasing me because at that time Rich and Jay Van Andel were in Nutrilite, the food supplement, before Amway. So because of Rich, yeah, I became a distributor for Nutrilite. I had 75 customers, but I had to go back and almost resell them every time I delivered because as they got the feeling better, Frank, they'd stop. <laughs> So I was at the bottom of my shoe straps trying to keep going until I and my wife went to a Tupperware party. She wanted to be a distributor, not just a dealer. One month later, after she borrowed 10 bucks from her mother to get the starting kit, I just watched things happen. I, one month later, it took me two days to put a seal on a Tupperware bowl. But I said, all right, I'll try it. So she lined up a couple parties for me, and I, I took off. And I had to go put 16 parties on myself before I could finally date one for myself. But I decided, Frank, when I tried to do a neutral light with one-on-one uh, -on -one with the Tupperware home party, that was reaching people for the same time and the immediate return. And I said, all I've got to do is have a better time than anybody else at that party. I guess I can make it. And I did, I made myself laugh. And I was putting on eight to nine parties a week. And a couple of Tupperware staff guys had happened to come through to check up on what was happening. And they talked. Hamer Wilson, the president of Tupperware, to bring me on the staff, and he did. Went to Orlando for two years on, on the Tupperware staff. I was able to get back to Grand Rapids as a distributor, which I did. I'd had enough of that traveling, crisscrossing the country, you know, as a sales counselor. And for 32 years, I was right there in Grand Rapids building up to 500, 600 dealer count, 40 managers of 40 cars, and just the most wonderful, wonderful 
selling experience. So I retired from Tupperware, the franchise, at the end of 92, stayed on as the president of the alumni for six years, and now I really am retired. <laughs> uh, I got news for you, Sam. The Michigan Military History Museum, which I have talked to you about, uh, is going to actively want to get you involved in this, so, especially after this interview. You may, you may not be retired anymore. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> we can't pay you, but we certainly can use your experience. <laughs> Sam, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. I well, really it's only because it. of you that this has been so easy for me. For Thank me. you, sir. I'm <laughs> glad to hear that. I'm very glad to hear that. Oh, boy.